Good. All right. So this is our first time, right, with Boober. So let's see what happened to you guys. <laughs> so remember our poll, one to ten. Any tens for Boober? Okay. No. Your faces, please. Pintado, Medina, Zimmerman, Santos, Prasha, Leventhal. I need to see your faces. Thank you. Okay, because I can't do the poll if I don't see your faces. All right. Any nines for Boober? Okay, eight, seven. Ah, Gogas, Halmorad, all right. Six, five, four. What's going on? <laughs> okay. Who are you who said four just now? I don't see your name. Yeah, you. What's your name? What's your name? No, <laughs> next to you. Oh, with the glasses, black shirt. <laughs> oh, it's Prashad, Maya. Prashad. Hello, Prashad. Okay, what did I say? Four? Okay, three, two, one. Oh, Flores. Oh, my God. Okay, let's start with the haters. Flores and then Prashad. What happened? <laughs> um, it was pretty wordy. Um, and there was, like, a lot of details that it, it was really confusing to see how they all connect together it doesn't connect <laughs> remember yeah. i told you right it's That's fragments right these are fragments of truth right nothing you cannot connect it right because there is no coherent picture anymore after the war right remember i mentioned that that we don't know anymore really where we're going but we have little bits and pieces <laughs> so good good observation flores right you Absolutely, there is no coherence. <laughs> uh, Prashad, what happened to you? <laughs> um, so I was reading it, and like it just like yeah, you were saying like you know it goes back and forth and back and forth. There's so many like concepts of just like I and it and like all of that whole entire thing, and it was just so hard to like follow and like actually understand what he's trying to say, like get one concept down. But basically, that's that's that. Okay, good, good. Yes, it's, it's different. Now it's getting difficult, right? Now we're entering some of the more 20th century, right? It's more difficult. Uh, so, was, so we had, uh, right before this, we had who? Kierkegaard is still okay, right? But when you enter the 20th century, so this is now Buber and Irigaray, it's a little more dense, complex. People are a little more, um, yeah, things just got more complicated in the world in general, so the writing is more complicated. <laughs> Grady, do you want to add? Yeah, I just want to ask you, do you ever um, wonder, uh, sorry, do you ever wonder, like, these, these authors, what their personal love life is? Like, uh, uh, do they actually even believe in what they're saying? Like, that's how they're reading. And that is be like, do you even believe this? Or are you just saying it's because of the experience you see from other people and the feelings from other people? Because like him, him, um, Boober, like, to me was almost talking. He was saying everything was personalized, but talking like third person in like a weird way. It's like saying like you and I, and it's not, it's not common for an author to be saying that throughout the, the, like most of the book or throughout um, the reading. So like that, like confused me. Like, do you even follow your own advice or whatever for me to read it and really get it and <laughs> go by which part. so a lot of these philosophers usually when you write if you're a writer it's usually that you're yourself struggling to make sense of your own life right so a lot of philosophers actually their writing is their highest self right but many many philosophers don't reach the bar but they believe it right there it's it's often the case that we know more than we do <laughs> So many philosophers, including Buber, right? They they really struggled, right, with relationships, with love, and they 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 are sharing with us the vision that they got. But themselves, sometimes it's hard to reach that bar. And if you read a little bit about Buber's personal life, you you'd see how he was struggling. Kierkegaard also, right, that we read. Uh, but their writing is coming out of that struggle. Does that make sense, uh, Grady? Yes, that makes sense. So they're writing to give themselves a direction. They, it's a product of their uh, own struggle. And it's often the writing is always higher than the person. Hassan, you want to add? Yeah, no, I was going to ask, is that, so in, with that said, is, is, is his philosophy, his artwork, because he does mention the, the, the importance of art when it comes to that's the reflection of who you think you are, who you want to be your outward whether that be sculpturing music whatever um it seems to me that 
I guess like he was talking to himself because his writing is his art. That's who he wants to be. That's who he wants to follow. Okay, better put than me. Thank you. I think that clarifies even more for you, Grady, right? It's, that, it's his attempt at making art out of his chaotic life, right? So, of course, the art is the vision and you're striving to, right? Even when I'm writing, if you read things I wrote and then you look at it, <laughs> right? It's always higher, right? So, even teaching, right? So, we are always giving you a vision that we have seen and further away, right? And we are ourselves also going there, <laughs> right? So any philosopher is himself part of the journey towards that vision, I think. So it's not that they're being hypocritical, it's that they sense the vision, the direction, but they are still themselves journeying towards that vision. Um, sense, it makes sense, Grady? And where is it? <clears throat> Grady, Grady? <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, good. All right. Okay, good. Uh, good question. Now, let's go to the lovers. There were a couple. Gogas, Halmurad, would you like to share your ecstasies with us? <laughs> I like that poetic style, uh, the way he presents it. Um, the information kind of flows. And I also like how he divides everything into I, you, and I, it. And it's easy to follow what he means. Um, those are the things that I love about Boober. Um, yeah, so that, that's my take on him. All right, so you enjoy the, the density and the complexity and the beauty of the language, right? Yeah. Uh, Gugas, do you want to add? You were one of the lovers, one of the rare lovers. <laughs> um, during our group, like, there were like some quotes that I was confused about and I, spoke about them and then like when Hammurad was explaining it I got it so it was like I while I was reading him I understood him and I understood like how he was going through it and I liked how he separated it how he separates his work into three sections because it kind of like helps you understand and like helps you understand like what his love is trying to get towards and like the aim of it so I liked how he had it Okay, so you like, you even thought he was structured, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like how he structured it, yeah. Within the chaos, you could sense an underlying structure. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> we'll have to put you in conversation with Flores. And uh, <laughs> who was the other one? Who were you, the other hater? Where were you? Where were you? Prashad. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, good. So any other remarks before we get in the text? Any other urgent uh, sharings? Okay. All right. So today we are going to study, go deeper into the IU, right? Remember, this is a, a type of relationship. So remember, or I thou, right? I, when I talk, I interchange the two. Okay. So forget, so forgive me. I, I forget which one I'm using. <laughs> Means the same thing. But remember, the problem with Buber is still our problem today. The way that our societies are becoming more are, are treating people more and more as its objects to be used and discarded, to be exploited and let go, to be killed, right? To be enlisted and to be killed, right? I'm giving some examples of how our society, right? Treats people as things that we can use a little bit and then throw away. Um, I mean, the way we treat our veterans, right? Is a perfect example. <laughs> we use them and then when we're done with them, away with you, right? We don't really have a system, very strong system. We have a few things, but we don't have a strong system of caring for them when they return, right? This is one example. The exploitation of workers is another example, right? I mean, even the way we treat the, old, the elderly, right? Okay, you function, you, you served your purpose, now I'm putting you over here. I don't wanna hear you anymore. <laughs> I'm done with you, right? So, uh, so these are, and then of course, all oh, the whole social media culture, right? Where we, we, be, we friend, we unfriend, <laughs> we date, we ghost. <laughs> so this is, you know, um, we do have, uh, um, we have fallen into this habit of seeing people like commodities, right? That we can use and then discard. So Buber is noticing this in his time in the thirties, but even now today we are still in that context, right? So what he's trying to do in the book, remember, is help us gain a deeper awareness or remember, right, what it is like to treat a human being as a human being. What does it mean? We have forgotten, right? We have forgotten the sacred uh, 
sacredness of human beings, how they are in a way different from other objects. We have lost that awareness. And so he's trying to teach it to us again, to help us remember what is it like to be in a relationship or in an encounter with a real human being? What does it entail? So the I, you, right? You have the I, it. Remember, this is how we see people as objects, right? This is the relationship between the I and the human being in front of me is a it, I, it. Now he wants to shift us into what does it mean to relate to someone as a you and not just as an it, okay? All right, so let's get into that. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna study actually just one little text and the way we're going to proceed, because this is like Hal Murad said, a very poetic language, we're gonna proceed like with Rumi. Remember with Rumi, we kind of all pitched in, right? We all jumped in, we all gave our perspective of what the interpretation is like because when you are dealing with poetry, you're dealing with something with many facets. There are many ways to understand one given metaphor. So today I'm gonna rely on you. I'm gonna read the sentence and then I'm gonna be like, okay, what does it mean? <laughs> and then you give me, there are many ways to interpret each sentence and we're going to be uh, thinking about this together. So go with me to page 55. I'm gonna be focusing on 55. Um, the top paragraph. There are actually three main points we're going to look at. Okay, everybody has page 55. Put your hand in the screen. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to start with the first point. First thing that the, so this whole paragraph is describing what it means to be with a you. What does it look like, right? First thing he says should sound very familiar, right? If you're connected, if you, if you remember Kant, right, that we did. That should sound very familiar. He says this, whoever says you does not have something for his object. Okay, what does it mean? How would Kant jump in at this moment? What do you think? I'm listening. What does it mean to see someone as a thing? That's basically what he's saying, right? Whoever to treat them as an end as opposed, I mean, to treat them as a mean as opposed to an end. Okay, so first thing, right, if we, we should be hearing Kant right there, right? Oh, Kant said that, right? Kant said we shouldn't treat them as a means, but as an end. They're not just there to be used. In fact, as soon as we start to use someone, we're missing the you. It's not that we're a bad person, we're simply missing out on the type of encounter we could have. We're having a kind of a downgraded encounter. It's just low, right? So that's the first thing, right? Medina, you had something to add. Um, give me one second, because I'm walking by construction and it's so loud. Okay, we um, don't hear sorry. it, by the way. We don't hear uh, it. I was saying, I was going to say that it's kind of like when you objectify a person, so you don't see them as like a person themselves, you just use them for your own benefit. Okay, very good. Another Kantian, right, perspective. You see them, ah! Oh, let me they're convenient right now right this person's presence in my life is convenient when i'm done with them when i'm ready to move on goodbye <laughs> right so, so a lot of us actually in romantic relationships right it's called settling <laughs> right? you settle for now it's okay but if someone better comes along you better you better go you better move out right so this is something very natural, right? That we feel we are entitled to do that. It's okay. But Bouber is saying you're missing out. If you're only on that level, you are missing out on the deeper encounter you could be having with that person, right? So very good. Okay, so that was pretty easy. We've done it before. We've studied Kant. Now, here's the one that is very interesting. I'm going a little lower, the end of the first paragraph where it says, the you has no borders. Put your hand in the screen if you are there with me. Second, first paragraph, the last line, the you has no borders, you're there? Okay. All right, this is the longest one. This is the most interesting one. What does it mean that the person, right, if you see them as a you, you're seeing them having no borders? What in the world does this mean? This is pure poetry. Of course, we all have a border, right? But what does it mean that to see someone as a you means to see them as having no borders? Okay, Hassan, go ahead. Sorry, was page? Uh, page uh, 55, the last line of the first paragraph, the you has no borders. See there? Yeah. Okay, good. Hassan, yeah, go ahead. 
I think it maybe has to do with the more um, spiritual uh, side of love um, or passion that maybe Rumi um, spoke about. Um, because I see very a very um, re very emphasis a, a big emphasis on the rejection of materialism, and I guess like the body. So the body is just a vessel. It's not you. It's not your soul. Your soul is something that could. Um, uh, uh, go past the body into other realms. Okay, good. So one way to see, to understand that you has no border is to see the person's soul and not just their body, right? So you're here with, um, who was it in Plato who said that? Uh, Posanias, right? Posanias was emphasizing falling in love with the mind, not just with the body, right? So this is a way of seeing the other as more than what they appear to be. There is more behind, right? Uh, it's, it's not just you're 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 um, you're not seeing the envelope of the body, right? You're not seeing the definite the the border of the body. You're seeing beyond the border to the soul. Okay, I like that. That works. We can write this down. Absolutely. Uh, Blades, do you want to add? <laughs> yeah, I was kind of making the same connections that Hassan was making. I'm thinking I'm a um in regards to Rumi. And I'm thinking of the particular quote where he's referring to everyone being an ocean and mm -hmm. how that may go along with this idea of there being no borders and how, you know, you, if you put borders on someone, then you're restricting your engagement, your um, encounter with them. And so if you remove those borders, it's like that vast ocean where there's, where it's a f more fulfilling and more um, engaging encounter. Okay, very nice. Let me elaborate on that, right? So first, let's all write this down, right? To put border on someone is to limit them, is to see only this. So let's go a little deeper into what Blades is saying. What does it mean to limit someone? How are many ways that we limit the other person? Let's, this is getting more precise. Like you're in a relationship and you start to limit. I think uh, Rumi talked about this. Uh, Kierkegaard talked about this already. So let's see if we can make some connections. What does it mean when you see someone just this and not the infinite possibilities? Give me some examples of seeing someone as just this rather than all of the possibilities they could be. Okay, Leon, speak to us. That's good. Speak to us. <laughs> I'm on the bus right now, but I speak to you guys in a bit, in like a minute. I'm about to get off. It's okay, you can talk in the bus, we don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're saying before about um, like it's, it's eliminating somebody and basically you're, you're creating this um, expectation of somebody so then like they may not be able to fulfill it and that may not be them, you know, it's not true. Excellent, Leon, right? As expectations, Rumi talked about this. As soon as you create, you should be this. You don't see everything else they could be, and they are also, any, everything else that they are. Very often we miss the beauty and the marvel of the person we're with because we are looking this. This has to happen, right? And we miss everything that the person already is for us. So expectations is a way to, to narrow your vision, right? To not really embrace the whole infinity of everything the person is giving you now you're just focusing on this little thing they're not giving you right so expectations buff, right that's a very nice way to limit and as soon as the person has to fulfill your expectation they're an object that you are fabricating right that's another thing about objects we fabricate them <clears throat> setting expectations on someone is a way to, you want to fabricate who they are you want to decide this is what husband, this is what wife is, this is what parent should be. I am fabricating you, right? This is also putting them at the level of an object that you, you, you make, right? So make sure you write this down, right? Very good. One way to limit the other human being and miss everything is to set narrow expectations. You do two things. When you do that, you miss everything that they are. And you also, in a way, are... Uh, you're you're imprisoning them in this expectation very good leon um let's see uh hot would you like to say more and then zimmerman i see where you're going you'll be next so hot speak to us hot <laughs> where's my hot oh like i'm basically i'm thinking that 
you're not able to like you're so stuck on this one thing that you're not able to see all the other good things that they do for you like, because you refuse to yeah That's about yeah, yeah. We become uh, short-sighted, right? When we have expectations and we miss everything that they already are in our lives. And we miss the gifts that they're already bringing that maybe don't correspond to what we were expecting. And that's why we are missing them, right? Very good, hot. Uh, Zimmerman and then uh, Blades. Oh, and then the rest of you, I'll get to you. So let's hear Zimmerman a little bit. Please elaborate. Zimmerman. Um, I think that every person in a relationship has like a certain perspective of like the way like it's supposed they perceive their relationship in a certain way like everyone thinks a relationship is supposed to be in a certain way and when you have a certain perspective on something and the person doesn't let's say um get to those standards it doesn't about doesn't fully fill that like um space that you're trying to have in your relationship you're kind of limiting them because your perspective is a little bit skewed because you're saying it's supposed to be this way and the second it's not there you're limiting them in that space so it's almost unfair because if they don't if they don't react that way it's not even their fault. It's just that your perspective locked them in. Yes. And I feel like in relationships, you have to always be able to change your perspective because it could just be that you're not looking at the right thing or they're not understanding. Exactly. Um, I, I, really, I love the way you put it, right? Because very often we expect the relationship to follow a certain timeline, to go according to a certain pace, right? And when it doesn't fit, we get angry. We think it's bad, right? We get outraged. And we're not realizing that the relationship, like Rumi said, right? It's not us who is making the relationship. It is the relationship that is supposed to make us, right? So surrendering, right, to the natural, uh, organic rhythm of the relationship, um, adapting. Remember in the Song of Songs, we talked about this, right? Adapting to the rhythm of the other instead of setting expectations for how the relationship is supposed to go how do we know <laughs> right why do we erect ourselves like the you know the creators and the masters of we don't know anything as human beings right so very good i like what you said um so hassan and then grady <clears throat> okay. i forgot to check out uh down my hand okay grady <laughs> Brady? All right. Um. Yeah. So what I was want to say was um having an expectation going to a relationship with an expectation is like going into a restaurant and um trying to trying to trying to basically know um what you're gonna order already without exploring everything else in the restaurant. Like if you go into um you know if you go into a relationship with an expectation with with a numerous expectation because there's always everyone has an expectation of what they feel they should be receiving but if you go in there with very specific and um not so not so much general expectations then you're just setting yourself up to um to be disappointed and you're setting you put yourself at a disadvantage just like you go to a restaurant and you are just set on this one meal to get this one meal when that one meal doesn't come out the way you thought that one meal will come out now you're upset you ordered that meal you spent your money on that meal and you didn't even explore any other, anything else on the menu okay nice you know, very good gravy i like that you miss the whole menu <laughs> right you want the fries and you miss everything else right very good now let me let me go a little beyond kierkegaard mentioned something like this also about how we limit the other does anybody remember what kierkegaard said when he talks about despairing of the other what does he mean? What does it mean to despair of someone? Uh, you'll see, it comes together with what we're doing here. What does it mean when you despair about someone? You start to despair over your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, your partner. How would Kierkegaard um, look at this? Anybody know? <laughs> uh, Levental, let's see what you have to say. You won't be who you need them to be. They won't be. Okay, so here we're still with the expectations. I want to move to a different point. Um, what does Kierkegaard say? If you recall in Works of Love, right, that we've just finished. <laughs> what did he say about the way that we encage and imprison someone? And how can we liberate them? Uh, Grady, go ahead. Oh no, sorry, I was accident. I I don't have. I'm trying to go find the exact uh, <laughs> what he said, but I have I like a, a general like um definition of like 
the room he was in when he's speaking of it. Okay, yes, everybody um, get back to their notes. Think about hope, right? Remember we talked about hope? What does hope do that despair hope. doesn't do? So despair is the exact opposite of it. It's when you lose all hope in something or someone. When you're in despair, you're, you're at a point where um, you're almost at a point of no return um, to an extent. You're, you're at a point where um, when it comes to certain things or of a, of a certain person, you know, some of them might make you um, upset. You know, certain things they do might throw you um, for a loop. It's just you, they've done something to, to get you to the point where um, you don't, you just don't believe just like yourself that you can not only see yourself with that person that but they're um liable to change and and you know basically like it makes you done with them and you're done with that person and everything they have everything that you feel like they have to offer or can't offer you're just completely finished with whoever that is you got it very good right to despair of someone is to be like that's who you've been that's who you've always been. That's who you will always be, right? That's it. That's who you are. You cheated. You a cheater. You'll cheat, right? You lied. You a liar. You'll lie, right? And right when we despair of someone, it's another way to create path, a little prison, a border, a limitation. And when we hope, what do we do? Path. We break. We break those limitations and we open up the person again to, okay, you lied, but the possibilities are endless as to who you could be now and who you could be in the future. So to hope in a way is to liberate someone from this narrow border we put on them through our despair, right? Everybody follow me on that one. This is an important point. I want to see it in your answers. <laughs> put your hand in the screen if you're following what I just said. Should I repeat? Must I repeat? Um, let me repeat briefly, right? When you despair, you think the person will always be who they were in the past. And like Grady said very nicely, you're done with them, right? When you hope, you kind of explode those borders. You realize, okay, you did this, but you could be anything else, right? I don't know. I'm hoping, right, that you will be, there are infinite possibilities who you could be now. And I'm allowing that. I'm creating the space. I'm expanding the space for you to become something else, right? At that moment, you are dissolving the borders, right? You're allowing that person to blossom again as a you uh, in the relationship, right? You're relating to them again as a you. Very good. Okay, any other way to see ways we put borders on people? What about stereotypes? How are these little borders we put on people? Give me some examples. <laughs> Grady, <laughs> it's you and me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this, this topic hits home but um for one like i'm an athlete right and the stereotype a lot about a lot of athletes i can't hear you but i know what you're saying <laughs> am i the only one who can't hear grady can you guys hear grady no Okay, Grady, we can't hear you, but we know what you're. <laughs> uh, we know what you're saying. Grady? Nope. Okay, so he was saying, right, the stereotypes about athletes. Anyone want to tell me what are some of those stereotypes? <laughs> I mean, um, one on campus is, um, you know, they're in college to play play sports. They're not. They're not in college to learn like other students or they're not as bright as other students. They just got in because of scholarships. But, you know, but then, you know, Brady's on the um, on the Queens College magazine. But he, uh, as I'm in his group, he's brilliant. You know, that stereotype doesn't work for him. <laughs> Thank you, Hassan. <laughs> OK, very good. We've destroyed one border. Excellent. How about other stereotypes you can think of that are, there are ways that we limit. Okay, Grady is an athlete. Oh, probably then he's this and this. And it's not true, right? So what are some other stereotypes that we place on people and therefore destroy their you? <laughs> uh, very good, Leon, right? You want to talk? You're off the bus? <laughs> Yeah, like just ethnicities, because there's like a lot of different stereotypes um, aligned to, you know, different ethnicities. I mean, would you like an example or like? Yes, please, Leon. <laughs> I guess for like Asian people, we're like, we're good at math or something, you know? 
I guess I could be honest. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of others, but <laughs> absolutely yeah. right. We play stereotypes, even when we call each other by our races, right? We have a. This is something that shocked me when I first arrived in New York, right? We don't do this um, in Europe so much, right? But here, there is this whole thing. Okay, this white guy, this Spanish guy, this this black girl. This we we tend to categorize people not by you know their I don't know gender or but we immediately very easily in the in, in New York categorized by race right and in a way right is there not is this not in a way to a certain degree reductive right because as soon as you put someone in a race boom there's a whole set of stereotypes that belong to this race and now they're this right ah Grady you're back <laughs> go ahead are you back yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you kicked me out. It's nice and terrible. Um, we, uh, we, so yeah, like I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, like I was, I heard you kind of saying it um, when I came back um, about, you know, you said about race and, um, you know, about uh, being a New Yorker stereotype. And for me, the common stereotype is, is of being an athlete and playing a sport, especially a sport in college. Um, you're looked at as someone who's seen by everybody, known by everybody, around everybody. So people, first impression of you a lot of times is, you know, that person's not gonna commit. That person wouldn't be into, you know, just being with one person, especially if you're one of those athletes that, you know, are, are above most um, most other athletes. Like you're, you know, um, good at your sport, known for your sport, like people, you get attention. Um, and with that said, what comes with that is the stereotype of, they're not people commit, they're not people there. Um, they won't have time for you. So um, I think that's the, the, like what you was like, for me, that's how I feel about the um, topic. Very good, yes, absolutely, right? We see someone from, even we see someone from a certain country and we're like, oh, they're cheaters, <laughs> right? We see some, I mean, I see this in New York, right? Some people will tell you, don't date that person from this country because they have a culture of cheating, right? And so, and the same with athletes, right? Don't date an athlete, they're non-committal, right? They, they just go from one person to the other, right? So absolutely. So these are all so many ways, right? That we limit each other and reduce each other to an it and miss the whole possibility of an encounter, right? The depth and the richness of the encounter. Very good. Now, let's skip to, uh, actually, let's look at the third one. Whoever says you, are you there on page 55 still, the bottom of that paragraph? Are you there? Whoever says you does not have something. Okay, we said that already. He continues, he has nothing. What does it mean to be in a relationship with someone and to have nothing? <laughs> What's he talking about here? What's one way we could interpret it? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Leon, for, for one thing, right, very good, to set no expectations, right, means that you're not expecting to get X, Y, and Z, right? You're just in the flow, right? You're taking whatever comes, you're receiving whatever doesn't come, you're cool, right? So an idea of not being in it for something that you have preordained in your mind, right? I'm in this relationship so I can get X, Y, and Z, right? You, in a way, you allow yourself to just experience the relationship as it comes rather than thinking, what can I get out of this? And am I getting what I need out of this, right? Is this relationship serving me? And as soon as you start to talk like that, you become a business transaction, right? It becomes a business transaction where with Rumi, with the children exchanging pieces of pottery, right? No, to be in a relationship, you have nothing, you get nothing, right? You just come, just experiencing the relationship as it comes to you, as it ebbs and flows, right? Relationships sometimes come, sometimes go, sometimes come, same person, right? Can be close, can be far, give, not give. It's like, you know, waves, right? You experience both, right? That's the idea, very good. Um, good, now there's one more quote I wanna look at, which is on page 62. <clears throat> Two more quotes, um, one is on 62. This one will remind you of Rumi. First line, the you encounters me. Who is there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay. The you encounters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. 
this should remind you of something that Rumi said. And can anyone explain to me what it means that you cannot find the you by seeking? And Rumi said something similar. Okay, very good, Leung. Um, yes, uh, Blades, go ahead. You can add. It was, it was something to the air of like the lover approaches at midnight. I think yes. that's the quote. That was and the it, quote. <laughs> it was the idea that, you know, um, the pursuit is going to interfere with your actual in finding of a soulmate. It's like if you're, when you're relaxed, when you're in the, the midnight, when you're resting is when you will find one rather than um, consistently seeking to force something. Because I think during, in the act of pursuit, in the act of forcing something, you're walking around with these expectations, with these assumptions that create borders rather than kind of experiencing someone in a, in a um, full way. Right. Uh, very good. Right. Rumi mentioned this, right? The, the friend comes at midnight. It's when you are in a restful state, when you're not trying to make it happen, that the soulmate comes, right? And this is like, we have such a tendency of wanting to know, right? Especially women, right? We want to know what's our status. Why are you still single on Facebook? Right? <laughs> right? Where are we at? Are we official? You know, <laughs> so we want to know and we want to, you know, kind of have this kind of security, right? And often we rush the thing, right? Because we want so quickly to be secure in the relationship that we rush and we, 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 we forget that the you encounters us by grace, that there is an allowing we need to allow, <laughs> right? There's an allowing we have to do so that the relationship right can be a soulmate relationship if we rush too quickly into expectations and you know commitment and security we miss right the fact that we cannot control this it comes or it doesn't come we cannot control this we can create a space that is welcoming but we can't make it happen we saw this with the song of songs remember right the woman trying to make the men commit. And the moment she releases, that's when he was able to come, right? The you comes when we have stopped all strivings, <laughs> whether it's seeking or trying to make it happen or securing commitment. When you cease all strivings, this is when the soulmate can finally come to you. We block them, right? By doing this. Uh, Blades, did you want to add or you just forgot to lower your hand? Yeah, I just forgot to lower my hand. Okay, good. All right, excellent. Let's go to the last one. This is a beautiful quote on page 62. Wait, oh, we were there. Sorry. <laughs> go to the third paragraph, the basic word IU. Are you there? Put your hand. Okay. The basic word IU can be spoken only with one's whole being. So this is already interesting, right? If you're in a relationship and you're not completely in, you're not with a you right? You can only see the you when you're completely engaged, involved, right? Otherwise, you're still thinking of them as an it, right? The sign that you're with an it is when you're not completely involved. You keep a part of you for yourself, right? The moment you know that you're truly entering an IU relationship is when you find yourself being completely involved and committed and engaged. All of you is there, right? At that moment, the you is revealed, right? The you of the other person. As long as you're holding back a little bit, there's still an it that you could just discard whenever it's convenient, right? So that's very profound already. The concentration and fusion into a whole being can never be accomplished by me, etc. Now here's the line. I require a you to become, becoming I, I say you. Okay, it's like a riddle. Anybody know what it means? What does it mean that I require a you to become? And as I become I, I say you. Anybody want to solve the riddle? What does it mean? <clears throat> Grady, go ahead. Um, I think it means that um, before you find yourself and uh, before, like before the person pursuing love and looking for love finds themselves in who they are, they need someone else to open up certain um, aspects of themselves that they can't even see to access to open themselves. Um, when you meet someone else, they 
exposure to new things that you haven't seen or felt before. Um, and they they learn they learn you and they get to know you and and through that you know maybe when you get upset they know how to calm you down when you get you know too low they know how to bring you back up um so that significant other builds you up in a way to where you finally start to understand yourself and when that you starts to get you to understand yourself that's when you can see that is you because you you've gotten to explain i you can't can't fully get someone else until you know everything about yourself. That's I, I feel like that's kind of when people get married. When you finally figure out like it's no longer I. I don't think of when I look at that person. I don't think of what can I really get from that person. Is what can I give to this person now? Beautiful, Grady. Very good. Right. Absolutely. The you find the true self in relationship that's what the text is saying you don't find yourself by yourself by you know building your career you don't find yourself by getting a job you don't find yourself by being financially secure that's not the highest level of your humanity the highest level of your self-realization right is in relationship with another person who can in a way when it's not about yourself anymore that's when you're self-realized. That's when you reach your full development. I love the way Grady put it, right? That's the difference between the shift towards a marriage, right? Is the shift when you're not thinking what's in it for me, you're thinking of the other. That is the psychological shift. I agree with you. That has to happen, right? If you're going to enter the marriage dimension, right? And, and most of us, we are not able to take that step because we are still thinking of the other as a mirror to me. Right, we are not thinking that I am now thinking of them. It's not just them thinking of me, caring for me. It's now me caring for them. And once you make that shift, you're ready for the next level, right? Um, so very good, right? I need you. I the moment I am in relationship with you, in a, with a you, right? When I start to become capable of engaging with another human being as a you, this is when my I comes to its full maturity, right? I require a you. I need to be in contact with, in relationship with you as a you for me to become fully myself, right? Fully human, fully realized. Uh, I think Blades, you had something to add or you just had a hand from before? Um, no, I mean, I, the one thing I had to add was really, I guess, the emphasis on understanding someone through relation. And there was a quote by um, Bruce Lee. And it was like you don't really know yourself until you until you've like interacted with someone else, um, or until you've known someone else. And it's kind of just the value that um, relationships have and um, self actualization. Very good, absolutely, very good. Um, I like that by Bruce Lee. Um, in fact, yeah, your opponent reveals to you who you are, right? If you're going to talk about martial arts, right? Your opponent reveals to you who you are as a fighter. As long as you're fighting by yourself, you think you're, you know, the best. <laughs> and then you get an opponent. Oh, okay, I need to fix this. I need to arrange this. So very good. Very good example. Grady, what can, what else would you like to add? Sorry, I feel like I'm dominating. That. It's fine. I had two more points. Um, <laughs> one point was, one, yeah, I had, I had two more points. One point was um, the fact that the basic uh, human instinct is the need for interaction is the need to meet other people and to learn other people and be around other people. So that in itself kind of tells you like, you need other people to, to be who you are supposed to be, right? Um, and then since I said something about marriage now, I want to bring up now divorce. Divorce is when, I feel like, like for me, divorce is now when that you starts to shift back to Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not getting enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you still now the you, you know, yeah, it's still married, you know, you still love that person. So it's still, you know, a you, but there's a, a slow shift to I, I'm not getting enough. I'm not receiving enough love. I'm not receiving enough attention to the point where it's okay, I am not happy. When I am not happy comes, that's when the divorce usually is just. Oh. Grady disappeared. <laughs> but well put though, <laughs> right? Uh, until he comes back, I'll summarize because this is a good point, right? Marriage is seeing the you and we'll talk about marriage next time with Uber. 
but divorce is the shift back into the I, right? Very good, Grady, no worries. Uh, we got you. <laughs> we wrote you down, <laughs> right? So make sure you guys write this down, right? The shift to marriage is a shift to a deeper sense of the you of the other and the fact that you are there for them. The shift to divorce is a shift back to yourself, right? This is... Um, a way to see it, a nice way to analyze it, I think. Interesting way to analyze it. Okay, good. Um, anything else? Any questions? Um, all right. Um, all right, so uh, let me turn off the recording.